thousand ones just like it, but let me set the tone for uh, how people have been feeling about Whataburger lately. It reads, you haven't lived until you had Whataburger. You haven't lived? Some of us haven't lived yet? That's going to change when we have Whataburger? What? It's a place that sells hamburgers. Your life does not become more real for having experienced Whataburger. It's close, but it, it just doesn't. In fact, let me make a prediction. What's going to happen is Whataburger is going to open. The line is going to be really long, like backup traffic long for about three months. It's going to be really a pain to get around in town, anywhere in that area. And then after about three months, we're going to mostly forget about it. It's not going to close. It's not going to you know, go out of business, nothing like that. I doubt that, but we're going to move past it. About this time next year, you know what we're going to be seeing online? You haven't lived until you've had in and out or any of those other restaurants. It's a place that sells hamburgers. What all that is, that's a lack of contentment in our part. You know, we have about 20 different places that sell hamburgers here already. We could just be content with those. Let me tell you a different story. I, I think I got, I got too touchy. Some of, you, some of you are really defensive about Whataburger. <laughs> Another story. This one's on me, so it's okay. I remember growing up, I always had hand-me-downs. You know, and, and that was really an unfortunate situation because my brother had absolutely no taste. You know what he wore almost every single day of the week? Sweatpants with the zipper pockets and everything. So you know what I got to wear every single day of the week about two years after he did? Sweatpants. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I convinced myself by about the fourth grade that once I get some Levi's jeans, mm, then I'll be cool. I'll be in. That's what was holding me back. It was just the Levi's jeans. Everything else was going great in my life, right? Uh, and so it wasn't until after college where I got anything beyond bargain bin jeans, but y'all, I held on to my hope. I remember the day I went out, I got some Levi's jeans. Oh, I was so proud of myself. I wore them out of the store and everything. You know what happened? No one suddenly thought I was cool. <laughs> Turns out the jeans were not the problem. <laughs> what that was, well, you laughed a little too hard at that one. <laughs> what that was, was a lack of contentment on my part. Turns out sweatpants are perfectly fine, especially when you're in like the fourth grade. I wasn't going to be cool either way. I was in the fourth, I was learning long division. You're not cool when you're learning, anyway. One more story this morning. I remember thinking to myself as a kid, I can't wait till I'm older, when I have a job, when I have some money together. Of course now, you know, I think to myself, I can't wait until I'm a little bit older and get to retire and have some real free time to me. I talked to some retirees. I saw how that was going. You know what I heard? Man, I wish I was younger and had that energy back. Turns out, no matter what age you are, you always feel like you're missing one piece. Gives you a lot to look forward to, huh? You all know the old saying, the grass is always greener on the other side. That rings true for us in one way or the other. For all of us it does, whether it's the jeans or the tool or the car, the house, maybe just money in general. Once we have that one certain thing, everything's gonna be amazing. Life's going to be good again. It might be, you know, once something comes here to Fort Smith, like the Whataburger, or once we go somewhere outside of Fort Smith, it might be once we get out of that summer heat, or if only we go back to some bygone golden era, whatever it may be, we, we always have something that we're discontent about. We always have something that, if only... You always have something, the grass is greener over there. Caused me to wonder how much of life is just spent being discontent, just being mad, and then once you get something, being mad about something else. And the thing is, we all have something like that. We all have something in our mind right now. If only we had that, it'd be good. 
And once we get that, we're going to find something else to be discontent about. And the thing about it is, and unless somebody has a private jet, a, a bank vault full of riches, and a time machine, I think we got to learn to just accept some of what we got. That's more or less, believe it or not, what's going on here in 1 Timothy. What's happening is the author is writing to more or less a, a young church startup, a church that had to make a lot of pivots, a lot of changes in their time, a lot of having to reassess, work through things. And so a theme that runs through this letter is, is advice, and the main piece of advice that I see is contentment, being okay with what you got. You know, early on it starts out, it's, it says more or less, hey, Timothy, you don't need everything in the world. You don't need the, the first century equivalent of the church with the water slide and the fancy coffee shop. Just You got good, faithful people. Work with them. Continues on. It talks about elders and deacons here. And I love the perspective because it doesn't, it doesn't tell elders and deacons you have to be perfect at all times and in all ways. It says you have to be okay with where you're at and let God continue to grow you from there. It's about contentment rounds itself off here in chapter 6, and now it's talking to the more well-off folks amongst the church. And just like everything else, it, it's telling them to be content. And it's actually one of the nicest things the Bible has to say about wealthy folks in the church. Like, you all remember the rich young ruler that Jesus encountered? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Go, sell everything you have, give it to the poor. That was pretty cut and dry. Here, it's much more relaxed. It's starting to get into sort of the Roman context uh, of Paul and the Apostles' age, not so much Jesus in Jerusalem. Um, and here, it's just, it just says, hey, just stop prioritizing wealth. Stop trying to impress people. Stop trying to play into Rome's game. Just start living the life that's really life. There's bigger things to worry about. What it's doing is talking about contentment. It's telling the rich folks in Timothy's time, and by the way, we're all rich compared to any of the folks in Timothy's time, so that the message applies to all of us. It's telling us, let it go. It's going to be all right. Things are as they should be. You don't really need Whataburger. You don't need those jeans. You don't need to be a different age or whatever else it may be. And even if, even if you do, worrying about it doesn't change that. So just know you don't have to impress people. You don't have to look like the smartest person in the room or win that argument. Right now, this very moment, you could just, with what you got already, you could just choose to be happy. You could choose to be content. Doesn't that sound nice, church? Just being content with life? Like right now, we could all just choose to be the happiest we've ever been. By my estimation, which doesn't mean much, but I'm, but by my estimation, happiness, it's like one-tenth our situation and like nine-tenths our choice of how we're going to interact with that situation. And so we could just start being content, start being pretty okay with where we're at. And yet notice this, absolutely none of us do it, right? Everyone's always discontent all the time. That's how we operate as people. What's going on there? Well, see, honestly, it's something that a lot of folks struggle with, myself included, just being content, just finding joy in where you're at. It's, it's simple, and yet it's hard. It's one of those sorts of things. And, you know, sometimes our, our lack of contentment, it can come from a selfish place. It can also come from just being on, on a mission, right? Being so dogged about the next step that you just can't be okay with where you're at now. So look at both of those for a second. Like, I'll tell you my dream, my, dr my selfish dream, and then I'll tell you the good one. My selfish dream, oh, I want a CNC router. They're like $3,000. They're half computer, half wood shop tool. They're absolutely pointless, at least for my use. I don't know what I'd use it for, but I want it. <laughs> I'm sure, you know, if you were a furniture maker or doing some sort of, Ikea, I think, uses a lot of, anyway, I don't need them, I want them. It's a selfish dream. Part of me just has to 
sort of let it go because I don't know where I'd put it. It's like 10 feet wide. I got to let that one go. Be content. But there's also, you know, there's, there's selfish dreams, but there's also missional dreams. Here at the church, you know, COVID shook things up. And, man, I know a lot of us were just so excited about the next season of life where, you know, it's sort of like we're freed up again. We get to do the next things again. And I know I'm excited about it because I just, I've always dreamed of, of a good church that meets both spiritual and physical needs, that's resourced well, that's just about its mission and getting after it. And that's something I see us getting back on top of. But, but right now I have a favor to ask of us just for today, maybe for next week too, we'll see. I just want us to be content for a moment. You know, before we go back and keep rebuilding. I mean, we have work yet to do, but wow. This church, seriously, we weathered COVID so incredibly well. We weathered all the messes that came with it so well. We have every reason just to be content for a moment, don't we? Just to sit back and say, whew, made it. A lot of our lay leaders, they, they saw to that. The, the amount of good work is just, it's inspiring. And so I want us to have that moment of just contentment, you know, before we keep on going, because, because sometimes even good dreams, even proper missions can rob us of our contentment. Right? We always got to battle with that. We always got to battle with just getting in a funk, being discontent, robbing from ourselves like that. You know, it's part of our default nature. It's something we have to check in on and adjust every so once in a while because we certainly don't want to spend our whole lives being discontent. That's no good. And we don't want to spend our whole lives just being complacent. That's no good. So we really got to check back in on that and thread the needle on that sometimes. There are... I'm sorry, I'm... Sincerely, this church did well under COVID. And I'm so proud of us and just, we got next steps to get to, but we're doing well. We are doing well, it's, it's good. First Timothy, it outlines three things that we can do while remaining content, three missional things we can do while remaining content. Three things that, that don't rob us of our spiritual health and well-being, and I want to just walk through them briefly because I see them as instructive for us. Briefly, those are being rich in good deeds, being generous, and sharing. All three are things that you can do without losing any contentment, any peace, any spiritual well-being. To put them another way, you can always see where there's something missing or something out of place and just address that situation. That shouldn't take even a bit of your peace away from you. You can always be generous. It's the second one. In fact, when you're content with where God has put you in that season of life, you can become incredibly generous. It becomes this sort of, oh, I'm doing fine. Here, you go ahead sort of mentality. Finally, you can always keep your contentment while sharing. You know, whether it's your own life or here at the church or whether it's sharing what's meaningful to you or sharing what you own or a meal or anything else. When you're content with what you got, you're able to really share it. You're proud of it. You're happy with it. You know, I think of our, our Mission Possible room. But on our end, it's people who were content with what they have and maybe had a little bit too much, and so they hand that off to the Mission Possible room. And then people get to go in there, and it just basic supplies that mean just about nothing to us, but through us sharing it, it's been changing the trajectories of people's lives. Just about once a week, we get a report of a family who, who's just been changed by it, just gets another lease on life from it. And it's just from us sharing, not even sharing, you know, anything that's world-ending for us. To close, let me just scale back and Let's see the thousand-mile overview of this scripture, because it's, it's one I just really like. What it's saying is it's a mistake to always be discontent. It's a mistake to always be mad about something, always be 
wanting the next thing, even if that thing's a good thing, that can just rob so much of your joy. And at the same time, being complacent isn't the answer. Just sort of sitting around and hanging out isn't the answer. That's just laziness. That's not a spiritual discipline. The trick I see in this scripture reading, what, what we're being invited to try out, is to first find a place of contentment. Check in with yourself. Check in with the church. Just be good with where you're at. Recognize we don't have everything, but God's given us so much. God's seen us through so much. We have way more than we really need. By the way, that works at home, that works at church. I'm sure, that works in your relationships everywhere you like. You can try that one out. And then, once you have that contentment, once, once you're just coming from a place of peace, all of a sudden you're not reacting to things, you're responding to things again. You get that sort of clarity, that deep breath sort of feeling. You get to move forward on things where, where you say, I'm, I'm good, but I'm not finished. Church, would you all try that out with me? Just while everyone, seemingly everyone in the world is going crazy in this post-COVID world trying to, you know, scramble and get back something and, you know, what's the next step and all that. Let's be the people who take a moment, who pause, find we're content, we're truly happy with where we're at, and at the same time, we are far from finished with the work God's given us. Again, we did so well during this crazy, mixed-up period of COVID, and that's not me saying it's over forever, we got to live with it and respond to it over time, but we did well through a whole lot of weirdness, didn't we? Let's take a deep breath. Let's get ready for what God has for us next. How do you stand and sing, God be with you?